Hello, my name is John Minnick, and you're watching Truth Hub TV. Welcome to episode four of the series, A Gift from a Muslim. In this episode, I will focus on one of the biggest and most important differences between Orthodox Christianity and Sunni Islam. That is core to the faiths, mediation and atonement. How does each of these two faiths differ in how our sins are atoned for and in regards to a mediator. Often any religion outside Orthodox Christianity will claim that humans do not need a mediator between them and God, and that God has made them capable of atoning for their own sins. And Sunni Islam is no exception to this line of thinking. I will read from the Bible and Sahih Muslim, as well as show some clips from the Christian Muslim debate in regards to this topic. I hope you enjoy it. On October 17, 2011, Christian apologist Dr. James White debated Muslim apologist and medical student Abdullah Kunde at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia on the topic, Can God Become a Man? James White has often called this debate his favorite debate with a Muslim because Abdullah Kunde is really nice, stayed on topic, read all the books that he sent him, and interacted with him to the best of his abilities. I would like to begin by playing a piece of each of their closing statements, because most of this episode's subject matter addresses the concepts expressed from both debaters. Now, just to let you know, both of these debate clips that I'm about to play are not just one smooth speech. There may be one or two gaps that I cut out of them to play only the parts that I wanted to emphasize. Let's begin with James White. The reason these things are important is because from the Christian perspective, we're talking about what God has done. Yes, to glorify himself. The whole reason of creation is, is wrapped up in what God has done in Jesus Christ. But also what God has done to show his love for each one of us here this evening. The message that we have is a message of love. I believe that the reason that the Son voluntarily submits to the Father is love. The reason the Spirit takes of Jesus' things and makes them real to his people is love. The relationship of Father, Son, and Spirit is marked by love. And it is God's love that brought about the Incarnation. Do you remember the story? I know we have a slight difference in interpretation, but of Abraham and his son. The Bible says it was Isaac. And you don't have to necessarily disagree with that, but do you remember the difficult thing that God asked Abraham to do? I mean, that's one of the most difficult things in all of the Old Testament scriptures, is what God asked Abraham to do. And the Quran verifies that God did ask him to do that. So we're both in the same boat in trying to interpret such a difficult thing. And yet, when you think about it, what God asked Abraham to do, to give his, the, the, the Greek term that's used there is monogenes, his unique son. Don't you think God can do more than Abraham can do? If Abraham was willing to give his unique son, then do you see why the incarnation is important? Because you see the incarnation means that God didn't give just one of his creatures. God's made lots of creatures. God can make human natures right and left. He has the power to do that. But you see, because of the incarnation, what we're saying is God gave himself. He didn't send somebody else to do it. He came himself. And yes, as I pointed out, because of the incarnation, we have a perfect mediator. We have perfect peace with God in and only through him. The incarnation is vital in regards to Jesus being the mediator and redemption and all those things. And I don't think we can really argue that this is not the message of the New Testament scriptures because it is. But even... Recognizing all of that, what it all comes down to 
for you and I here this evening. As you walk out of this room, do you have peace with God? None of us has any guarantee of tomorrow. You walk down a, you walk down a street, someone gets drunk, they drive their car off the, onto the sidewalk and take you out. You don't even see it coming. None of us have a guarantee of tomorrow. How do I know I have peace with God? We know God exists, both Muslims and Christians together. Though we use different terms to describe it, you talk about the fitra, do the nithaq, and the covenant that was taken from, from uh, all of Adam's offspring, and, and uh, we identify it as the image of God because we're created the image of God, and, and therefore we suppress the knowledge of God. We have different ways of saying it, but we wrote, both recognize that people know God exists. And you're going to stand before him. And you know he's holy and you know you're not. I need a mediator. I need a go-between. I know I cannot provide what I need in and of myself. I can repent all day long. Even my repentance is unclean before a holy God. I need a mediator who can grab hold of me and my God. And that's what I have because of the incarnation. Notice that James White pointed out that we recognize two things. One, we are sinners. And two, God is holy, just, and righteous. Based on those two things alone, we really don't feel confident that we can stand before God and be worthy of heaven instead of hell. Naturally, to cushion that uncomfortable space that we wouldn't want to stand in, we need to put something else in there. Is it a bunch of religion, or is it a perfect mediator? Let's see what Abdullah Kunde says in part of his conclusion. So said he who came after. I'm wondering how can I possibly match something like that. But uh, anyway, I'll have my best crack at it. I disagree slightly with Dr. White. I, I do hope that you were at least somewhat entertained, but I hope you look at it more in terms of infotainment as opposed to entertainment. Um, you know, my brother's pretty big on the Discovery Channel, and if it weren't for that, he probably wouldn't know that the sky is blue. So uh, uh, I think that you know we need to find a balance sometimes with those things. I do also think it's important that we we do continue to have discussions like this and we also accept the reality that in history <coughs> gone by unfortunately this was the norm now I think it was so beautiful that uh, Dr. White brought up the story of Abraham peace be upon him now interestingly in the Quran we have another story uh, with Abraham peace be upon him and it was that he asked God Almighty to show him how he brings life or gives life back to the dead and so God instructed him to um, kill a couple of animals and then God brought them back to life. Now, Abraham did not ask God this in terms of what we believe. He did not ask God this because he did not believe God could do it. But he wanted what we uh, call in Islam, yaqeen, certainty. He wanted certainty. And there's three types of certainty. You can get certainty from eyewitness. You can get certainty from, uh, you know, irrefutable rationale um, and you can get certainty from from direct experience and Abraham peace be upon him wanted that eyewitness certainty now we believe and I say this to all the Muslims in the room uh, in particular that our faith is based upon certainty okay we don't believe that you can build certainty upon sand and my honest belief and I'm not saying this to offend Christians is that the Christian theology is, at best, a sandy surface. We absolutely believe in certainty. It was also interesting that Dr. White gave the example of a, uh, a drunk driver uh, potentially ending someone's life unexpectedly. Um, there was uh, a case where one of our Muslim brothers, uh, younger than me, was working as a security guard um, on Friday evening, was uh, actually killed when uh, a truck drove straight into his um, guard station. It was at a, uh, you know, a, a docking station for a, a fenced-off area. And, uh, in fact, I know that some of my family are at his, uh, you know, I guess what the Christians would term awake tonight. Uh, it's actually a uh, religious activity that we do when, when one dies. And 
And I can say about our, our brother that, um, you know, exactly what God says to us in the Quran, which is he promises the believers paradise. Okay, now God knows that I'm not sinless. God knows that I've certainly got my problems, you know. I mean, if my wife knows it, well, then God certainly knows it. <laughs> but he gave me that promise. And he gave all the Muslim believers that promise. And uh, that's what certainty is all about. Okay, because we believe that certainty and faith are combined. Okay, we don't believe that faith is just something that sounds good, feels good, whatever. We don't accept that. We think that faith and certainty are the one thing. And in fact, and Dr. White will appreciate this, in Arabic the word is iman, in Hebrew it's imuna, and it's, it's something that, you know, you affirm. Okay, so we don't say we have belief, we say we have an affirmation. Okay, and you don't affirm something, as I said, on a, on a basis of sand, or, or, or a basis that is uncertain. Uncertain, sorry, I should say. That was horrible usage of the Queen's English. Uh, <laughs> now, God gave himself, and, and, and according to the Christians, and, and, you know, I mean, that's, that's beautiful. Um, but you know what? I think we've got so much more to be thankful for. Uh, you know, God gave us air. Did he have to give us air? You know, he gave us food. Did he have to give us food? Uh, you know, he's given me the, the physical ability just to stand here and talk to you right now. Did he have to do that? You didn't have to do any of that. You know, and I think as a society overall, particularly us living in a, a developed Western country, you know, the concept of, of thankfulness is something that's often, often lost. And hopefully that's something that Christians and Muslims at least will be able to agree on after tonight, that, uh, that we certainly do need to be more thankful. And if, you, and if you want to be thankful for your belief that God gave himself, that's great. I'm thankful for everything uh, that, that he's done, not only for me, but but just for existence itself. And even though I may not express that in the best manner, and I know that I certainly don't, um, I have confidence that, that God accepts what I give him as long as it's to the best of, of my ability. Now, I certainly do appreciate, and this is obviously the fundamental difference between the two of us, I do appreciate that the idea of God being so holy that we must have a mediator is beautiful. In fact, I think it's humbling, you know, and I'll be quite frank, I find it hard to listen to, you know, that 15 minutes or 12 minutes of, of sermon and not, um, you know, feel emotionally, uh, you know, impressed. But we ultimately say, we ultimately say that this idea is imposing a created idea upon the uncreated. You know, to, to present a mediator, and this is the whole point ultimately of what we're saying, for us to present a mediator implies a limitation upon God. He can't approach us without a mediator, is what you're saying. For, for you to say that he became man, again, as I said, and I know that it was elicited in a very academic manner, for us that is a limitation upon God. You may not believe it, and that's fine, but they're the differences in what we believe. Abdullah Kunda said that his faith is based on certainty. It seemed like he claimed that certainty is on what God is able to do, but not necessarily on our certainty in peace with God, although he did make a case for that as well. He said that God has promised the believers paradise. Now, after reading the Quran and all of Sahih al-Baqarah and all of Sahih Muslim, I find different ideas like Anyone who does this bad deed will surely be in hell. Or, anyone who prays all the daily prayers and or follows the rules will enter paradise. I've seen some that said that anyone who memorizes the 99 names of Allah will enter paradise. My point is that where there are many ideas of blessings and cursings pronounced on people in general, the question, what must I do to have peace with God, is still left open for more spiritual authorities to rise up and say, if you are still uncertain, just do what I say and you should be okay, because I have studied all this more than you have. If you listened attentively to what both people said, you may notice a clever comment that Abdullah Kunde did with one of James White's points. 
James White was thankful for Jesus. Abdullah Kande broadened it to be thankful for all of God's creation. That sounds like a good one-up on James White's claim. But if you think about it, it's a polite jab at James White's elevation of Jesus as the one we depend on for our salvation into just a part of God's creation. Yes, we are thankful to God for the food that we eat and the air that we breathe, but we can be more thankful for Jesus because we believe that Jesus is the Creator who gives us all those things. In the chance that any Sunni Muslim may happen to be watching this episode, I would like to expound on the idea of where Orthodox Christianity gets the idea of a mediator who is also the Redeemer who atones for our sins. This isn't some foreign concept that Christians came up with on the fly. It has actually existed since the beginning. For any Sunni Muslims that may be watching, I would like to justify my sources from an Islamic perspective. But how is it that they come to you for judgment while they have the Torah, in which is the judgment of Allah? Then they turn away even after that, but those are not in fact believers. Indeed, we sent down the Torah in which was guidance and light. The prophets who submitted to Allah judged by it for the Jews, as did the rabbis and scholars by that with which they were entrusted of the scriptures of Allah. And they were witnesses thereto. So do not fear the people, but fear me, and do not exchange my verses for a small price, i.e. worldly gain. And whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed then it is those who are the disbelievers, and we ordain for them therein a life for a life, an eye for an eye, a nose for a nose, an ear for an ear, a tooth for a tooth, and for wounds is a legal retribution. But whoever gives up his right has charity, it is an expiation for him. And whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, then it is those who are the wrongdoers, i.e. the unjust. And we sent following in their footsteps Jesus the son of Mary, confirming that which came before him in the Torah. And we gave him the gospel, in which was guidance and light, and confirming that which preceded it of the Torah has guidance and instruction for the righteous. And let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. And whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, then it is those who are the defiantly disobedient. And we have revealed to you, O Muhammad, the book, i.e. the Quran, in truth, confirming that which preceded it of the scripture, and as a criterion over it. So judge between them by what Allah has revealed, and do not follow their inclinations away from what has come to you from the truth. To each of you we prescribed a law and a method. Had Allah willed, he would have made you one nation united in religion, but he intended to test you in what he has given you. So race to all that is good, to Allah is your return altogether, and he will then inform you concerning that over which you used to differ. According to the Quran, the Torah and the Gospel were sent down by Allah, and we are to judge by them. Also, the Quran was sent down to confirm the previous scriptures. I know that there are claims by Muslims that the Torah and the Gospel have been corrupted because they say things that contradict the Quran. I am aware of some of the interpretations of these Quranic verses. Because that is not the focus of this episode and because I don't want this episode to go on several hours of rabbit trails, let's assume that I am going by my best interpretation of these Quranic verses and move on. The word of your Lord has been fulfilled in truth and in justice. None can alter his words, and he is the hearing, the knowing. 
I understand that when I am appealing to a verse like this to support Christianity, that some Muslim apologists would argue that I am taking it out of context. Some could say that the original manuscripts of scripture cannot be changed and that all Christians have are corrupted copies of that. We don't have the originals. I would argue that the same God who could preserve his word and wanted to get his truth out would not hide or allow his truth to be hidden for many generations. If Muslims believe that the Torah and the Injil are the words of God, why could God not keep them preserved like he does with the Quran? And recite, O Muhammad, what has been revealed to you of the book of your Lord. There is no changer of his words, and never will you find in other than him a refuge. Again, if there is no changer of God's words, why would God allow people to corrupt his previous words to the point where we can't even find evidence of the originals? The Jews were extremely careful of protecting, preserving, and copying the Tanakh. The Christians made copies of pieces of the New Testament and spread it around the world. There was no leader of the Christians who could collect all copies of the New Testament scriptures and corrupt them. The New Testament scriptures were being copied by Christians to give to anyone who wanted a copy. There was no group of evil people behind locked doors making purposeful changes and not letting anyone else know what they were doing. It was narrated that Ibn Umar said some of the Jews came and called the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, to Al Kuf, and he came to them in their school. They said, O Abul Qasim, a man among us has committed zina with a woman, so pass judgment concerning them. They set out a cushion for the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, and he sat on it. Then he said, Bring me the Torah. It was brought, and he took the cushion from beneath him, and placed the Torah on it, and said, I believe in you, and in the one who revealed to you. Then he said, Bring me the most knowledgeable amongst you. And a young man was brought to him, and he mentioned the story of stoning as mentioned in the Hadith of Malik from Nafi, number 4446, Hassan. Now, I understand that some Muslim scholars would consider that as a weak Hadith, but we at least know that the Quran does affirm the Torah. If the Quran does say that we are to judge by the Torah and the Gospel, and that no one can corrupt the words of Allah, then we could at least assume that the people in Muhammad's day possessed an uncorrupted version of the Torah and the Gospel for those Quranic passages to make sense to the people to which they had been written. Of course, I don't want to waste time arguing about corruption of texts, but I am just laying down an Islamic appeal to the scriptures. Let's take a look at the Torah. Now, thinking about what James White said about our mediator who stands between us and God, let's look at some of the things that the Bible has to say about redemption and mediation. Let's start with something in the Torah. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This passage is known as the Proto-Evangelium. When God cursed the serpent for deceiving Eve, he also promised that the serpent's head will ultimately be crushed, while only crushing the heel of the seed of the woman. We see the crushing of the serpent's head as the fatal condemnation of Satan in the last days, whereas the crushing of the heel of the seed of the woman as the painful but not ultimately fatal crucifixion of Jesus. As mentioned in episode 2, both Christians and Muslims believe that Jesus was virgin born, 
Thus he was from the seed of the woman, but not from the seed of a man. Just some food for thought. Let's take a look at one of the oldest books in the Bible, the book of Job. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. But ye should say, Why persecute we him, seeing the root of the matter is found in me? Be ye afraid of the sword, for wrath bringeth the punishments of the sword, that ye may know there is a judgment. Job was most likely written before Moses, and many scholars believe that Moses may have taken it with him. What I am showing here is that the idea that faith in the living Redeemer, confidence in a bodily resurrection, and that the Redeemer would be persecuted had been passed down since the fall. It's not some kind of new concept that Christians invented. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. King David obviously had some knowledge of this Son, who is someone to be feared, to those who don't love him, and blessed to those who trust in him. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me, and from the words of my roarings? Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths, as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them, and cast lots upon my vesture. Wow! This sounds like it is describing the crucifixion of Jesus. Yet, this was written by King David about a thousand years prior to Jesus. Now, if you search for Psalm 22 online, you would find all kinds of interesting theories depending on the perspective. Some secular critics would claim that it was actually written in the first century because they just can't accept the idea that something that detailed about Jesus' crucifixion could have been written that long ago and before crucifixion was even conceived. Some Jewish scholars would claim that King David was simply describing a man crying to God to rescue him from his enemies. Thus, on one hand, you have Jewish scholars saying, of course King David wrote that psalm a thousand years before Jesus because it's actually not talking about Jesus. You just think that it is. It has been in our Psalter for generations. Then, on the other hand, you have secular scholars claiming that it sounds so much like it is talking about Jesus' crucifixion that it just could not have been written until soon after the event. As a Christian who believes that Psalm 22 was a prophecy of the crucifixion of Jesus, can you blame me for wanting to say, 
just accept the obvious that God is amazing in his ability to prophesy the coming of the Redeemer that even Job talked about earlier. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Notice that last verse. It sounds like King David was confident that God's mercy would be with him through his life, and that he knew that he would live with God forever. For some reason, I don't see that certainty when I read the Quran and the Sunni Hadith. Yet, I seem to find it in the authors throughout the Bible. This is more evidence that the Christian gospel of eternal security and faith in the Redeemer is not something that was invented after the claims that Jesus rose from the dead. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The prophet Isaiah is chock full of theological and prophetic goodness. Here he claimed that a child would be born who would be called the Mighty God. How many Muslims would call Muhammad the Mighty God? Yet here in the Jewish scriptures is a child and son being born who is called the Mighty God. Keep in mind that Isaiah was written about 700 years before Jesus was born. Still think that Christianity came out of a vacuum only 2,000 years ago? Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared, and have saved, and I have showed, when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. We saw previously that Isaiah had claimed in chapter 9 that a child would be born who would be called the Mighty God. Yet Isaiah is also chock full of monotheism. He often quotes God claiming that he is the only God and that there are no others besides him. But notice that he also said, Beside me there is no Savior. May I remind you of what we read in the earliest book called Job, where Job said that he knew that his Redeemer lived and that he would stand in the latter day upon the earth. Both Christians and Muslims believe that Jesus is coming back in the latter day to judge the earth. My Muslim friends, can you see how there is more sense and depth to the Christian perspective of why Jesus is coming? You believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, was sinless, is called the Word of Allah, performed the most amazing miracles, was rescued from death, ascended into heaven, and is coming back to judge the world. Yet you believe that not only is he just a prophet, but he's also only in the second level of seven levels of heaven, according to the Hadith about the Mirage. 
Why would Allah pick someone from the second of seven levels of heaven to be the one to come back and judge the world? According to the Hadith about the Mirage, Moses is in the sixth level of heaven. Why wouldn't Moses be the one to judge the world? Why not God? Of course, in Christianity, we do believe that God is the one coming back to judge the world. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. We see that Isaiah identifies the Lord, Yehovah, as both the King of Israel and Redeemer. It is clear that Isaiah believes that there is only one God, and that that God is the only Savior and Redeemer. This God said that beside me there is no God. Tell ye, and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Once again, Isaiah calls God a Savior, and the only God. He also said that everyone should look to Him for salvation, and that he declare that to Him every knee will bow, and every tongue will swear. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. What did Jesus just say there according to John? Did Jesus just call him the Good Shepherd? And that the Good Shepherd gives his life for the sheep? Didn't King David call the Lord his shepherd in Psalm 23? But didn't the same King David in Psalm 2 tell us to kiss the son lest he be angry, and that we are blessed if we put our trust in him? Are you noticing a connection here, my Muslim friends? Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, remember Genesis 3.15 that I read at the start that talked about the seed of the woman that would bruise the head of Satan? Remember Job saying that he knew that his Redeemer lives and that he will stand at the latter day on the earth? Well, Paul in Galatians 3.19 mentioned that the mediator was this seed that had the promise. He would be our mediator. The law shows us our transgressions because none of us can fulfill it. It also brings us to Christ.
For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Jesus Christ is this promised mediator who gave himself for us. My Muslim friends, do you see all the connection here? Do you see why Christians are insistent that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead rather than escape crucifixion and ascended into heaven? It is no minor thing on whether or not to deny Jesus' crucifixion. We don't follow Jesus just because of what he said. Many people have said good things. <clears throat> we follow Jesus because of who he is and what he did. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Notice that in the Jewish scriptures, that God had already promised that there would be a new covenant made with Israel and Judah, and that it will not be like the old covenant. In this new covenant, God will write his law into the hearts of his people so that all of them will know him. Who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath he ordained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith a new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish. The author of Hebrews quoted what we just read from Jeremiah 31, claiming that the new covenant is here and that the old one is passing away. Now, if you have the view that the new covenant is all the elect people, then this makes sense. Most of the New Testament is about the gospel, which is about salvation and sanctification. It sure sounds like it's talking about God's laws in their hearts. But Christ being come on high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkleth the unclean sanctifieth through the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. 
and for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dictated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats, with water and scarlet, wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. This is something that I would really like our Muslim friends to understand. You know that God commanded the Jews to bring animals as sacrifices for sins and for the priests to sacrifice them. You also know that your Muslims offer sacrificial animals during Hajj. You also celebrate the idea that when Abraham was about to kill Isaac, that God sent a lamb to be sacrificed in his place. My question for you is, what does this all mean? Does God just like to have people kill animals for their sins? Does that satisfy God's law? If we sin, is God really okay with us if we simply kill an animal? Maybe it has a profound meaning that we need to understand. Maybe those animal sacrifices pointed to someone else. To the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the Judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the Mediator of the New Covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that sprinkleth better things than of that of Abel. My Muslim friends, do you see the connection here? Jesus is the Mediator of the New Covenant. It all points to Jesus. That same one you believe was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, performed many amazing miracles, was the Messiah, was called the Word of Allah, ascended into heaven, and is coming back in the latter days. Ask yourself why Jesus was all of those things. The Bible explains why for all of that. Do you get the why for all of that in the Quran or the Hadith? Now, this is by no means exhaustive of the Sunni Islamic materials about the subject of mediation and redemption. I am in no expert in Sunni Islam. I am just going to cite some interesting hadith in Sunni Muslim that describe the subject mainly to show how Sunni Islam is different than Christianity on the subject. Evidence that the Islam of one who becomes Muslim on his deathbed is valid so long as the death throes have not begun. Abrogation of permission to supplicate for forgiveness for the idolaters. Evidence that one who dies an idolater is one of the people of hell and no intervention can save him from that. Sa'ib bin al-Musayyab narrated that his father said, when Abu Talib was dying, Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, came to him and found Abu Jal and Abdullah bin Abi Umayya bin al Mugaira with him. The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, O uncle, say, La ilaha illallah, a word for which I will testify for you before Allah. Abu Jal and Abdullah bin Abi Umayya said, O Abu Talib, will you turn away from the religion of Abdul Mutalib? The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, kept calling him to Islam, and he repeated this statement to him, until the last words that Abu Talib spoke indicated that he followed the religion of Abdul Mutalib, and he refused to say La ilaha illallah. 
The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, By Allah, I shall pray for forgiveness for you so long as I am not forbidden to do so. Then Allah Most High revealed, It is not proper for the Prophet and those who believe to ask Allah's forgiveness for the mushrikun, even though they be of kin, after it has become clear to them that they are the dwellers of the fire. And Allah Most High revealed concerning Abu Talib and said to the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, Verily, you, O Muhammad, guide not whom you like, but Allah guides whom he wills, and he knows best those who are the guided. Remember episode one, when I told and illustrated my best summary of Muhammad's life from a Sunni perspective? Of course, there were a lot of details left out of there. But I did mention a couple names there that you may remember. This hadith mentioned the names Abdul Muttalib and Abu Talib. Abdul Muttalib was Muhammad's grandfather who took care of him when his parents died until he was eight years old. Abu Talib, Muhammad's uncle, took care of Muhammad after Abdul Muttalib died. Remember that they grew up in Mecca, which was a polytheistic society. Thus, both Abdul Muttalib and Abu Talib were polytheists. At Abu Talib's deathbed, two people were by his side, Abu Jal and Abdullah ibn Abi Umayya ibn al mughira Muhammad and the two were basically having a rap battle over Abu Talib's soul. Muhammad was asking Abu Talib to say, La ilaha illallah, which is part of the first pillar of Sunni Islam called the Shahada, and is Arabic for there is only one God, Allah. Muhammad's rap battle opponents were arguing against that to Abu Talib, asking him if he is willing to turn away from the religion of Abdul Muttalib, the polytheism of Mecca. At Abu Talib's dying breath, he clung to the religion of Abdul Muttalib, and refused to give it up. Muhammad told Abu Talib that he will intercede to Allah on his behalf. Allah revealed to Muhammad that it is forbidden for him to pray for mushrikun, even if they are kin. Now, shirk is the Arabic term for association. For instance, if you have heard of the phrase, shirk your duties, you may realize that it has to do with dividing your responsibilities to others instead of doing them all yourself. In the religious sense, it has to do with not associating anyone or anything with Allah, because He is the only God. In Sunni Islam, shirk is the unforgivable sin. The prefix mu in Arabic means person of, thus a mushrik is a person of shirk. The suffix un makes the word plural, thus mushrikun means people of shirk. Allah told Muhammad that he can't pray for the people of shirk, because their destination is the fire. According to this hadith, Abu Talib is in the hellfire now, despite Muhammad's intercession. Now, could there be more to this story? Let's take a look. The intercession of the Prophet, peace be upon him, for Abu Talib and the reduction of his punishment as a result. It was narrated from Al Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib that he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, have you benefited Abu Talib in some way? For he used to defend you and get angry for your sake. He, peace be upon him, said, Yes, he is in the shallowest part of the fire. Were it not for me, he would be in the deepest part of the fire. It was narrated that Abdullah bin al-Harith said, I heard al-Abbas say, I said, O Messenger of Allah, Abu Talib used to defend you and support you, and he got angry for your sake. Will that be of benefit to him? He said, Yes, I found him in the depths of the fire and brought him out to the shallowest part. A hadith similar to that of Abu Awana, number 510, was narrated, 
from Sufyan with this chain from the Prophet peace be upon him. Kudri that mention of Prophet's uncle Abu Talib was made in the presence of the Messenger of Allah peace be upon him. And he said, perhaps my intercession will benefit him on the day of resurrection, and he will be placed in the shallowest part of the fire, which will reach his ankles, causing his brain to boil. The least severely punished of the people of the fire. It was narrated from Abu Sa'id al-Kudri that the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, the least severely punished of the people of fire will wear sandals of fire, and his brain will boil because of the hard heat of his sandals. It was narrated from Ibn Abbas that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, The least severely punished of the people of fire will be Abu Talib, who will be wearing sandals because of which his brain will boil. Abu Ishaq said, I heard An Numan bin Bashir delivering a kutbah, and he said, I heard the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, say, The least severely punished of the people of the fire on the day of resurrection will be a man beneath whose feet will be placed two coals, because of which his brain will boil. It was narrated that An Numan bin Bashir said, the messenger law peace be upon him said, the least severely punished of the people of the fire will be a man who has sandals and sandal straps of fire, because of which his brain will boil as a cooking pot boils. He will think that no one else is being punished as severely as he but he will be in the least severely punished of them. The evidence that whoever dies upon disbelief, no good deed will benefit him. It was narrated that Aisha said, I said, O Messenger of Allah, during the Jahiliyyah, Ibn Judan used to uphold the ties of kinship and feed the poor. Will that benefit him as whole? Well? He said, it will not benefit him because he did not say even for one day, Lord, forgive me my sins on the day of judgment. We do find that Muhammad's intercession did do something for Abu Talib, although it could not rescue him completely from the hellfire. Because we learn that the Mushrikun are destined for the hellfire for eternity. We saw several variations of the story. Some say that Abu Talib is now in the shallowest part. Some say that he will be in the shallowest part on the day of resurrection. Some say that Abu Talib is wearing hot sandals. Some say that his feet are between two coals. Some say that he is wearing sandals with straps made of fire. Some say that this hotness on his feet causes his brain to boil. This is the place of least punishment in the hellfire. The point I want to make with this story is to show that if you don't have a perfect mediator, like Jesus in Christianity, you have to depend on other forms of mediation. In this case, Muhammad interceded for Abu Talib, which gave him lighter eternal punishment. Also, Abu Talib was not seeking Muhammad's intercession. In Christianity, we can intercede for others, but not to get God to forgive them in spite of their own faith. We intercede on behalf of others to ask God to convict them of the truth so that they will believe it, because that is the only way. Jesus is their only mediator who actually changes their hearts. It was narrated from Abu Sa'id al-Kudri that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Allah will admit the people of paradise to paradise, and he will admit whoever he wills by his mercy, and he will admit the people of the fire to the fire. Then he will say, Look, and whomever you find with a mustard seed's weight of faith in his heart, bring him out. They will bring out people who have been burnt like charcoal. Then they will be thrown into the river of life, Al-Hayat, or rain, al haya from which they will emerge like seeds sprouting at the banks of the flood. Do you not see how they merge yellow and curved? 
Here is a story that seems more merciful than the last one we read about Abu Talib. But this one focuses on redeeming faith. There is this idea in the Sunni Hadith that anyone who has said La ilaha illallah and truly meant it in his heart, he will ultimately end up in paradise. Now, if some of those people committed bad sins, they could end up in hell temporarily. That is what this Hadith is addressing. There are supposedly people who were bad sinners, but they had that faith as the grain of a mustard seed, which allowed them to be taken out of the fire after they were blackened from it. They sprout as seeds in the river of life. How beautiful, huh? The Orthodox Christian perspective has only two kinds of people, the elect, who go to heaven forever, and the non-elect, who go to hell forever. There are no people who are ever in both places. We can affectionately call God Father because we know that He is our Father and that He has adopted us as His sons. It seems like every other religion besides Orthodox Christianity wants to have at least three destinations or some kind of third condition to deal with people that are moderately good because most people look like they fall under that category. For instance, according to Roman Catholicism, there is a place called Purgatory that sinful believers go temporarily to have their sins purged out so that they may be clean to enter paradise, or heaven. In Mormonism, there are three levels of heaven, celestial, terrestrial, and telestial, and there is a spirit prison and a lake of fire. The one who follows all the Mormon rules and procedures goes to the celestial kingdom where they can become gods. The moral people who didn't quite make it there go to the terrestrial glory. The bad people who have at least had the four fundamentals of the gospel applied to them get to the telestial glory. The ones in spirit prison are stuck there until they have faith and repentance and have someone else get baptized and have hands laid on them on their behalf, which are the four fundamentals of the gospel in Mormonism that you need to get out of spirit prison. The only people who go to the lake of fire in Mormonism are apostate Mormons, which sounds like a clever way of keeping people in Mormonism. In Watchtower Jehovah's Witness theology, there are 144,000 people who go to heaven. There is a great crowd that will live on paradise earth and the rest of the people are annihilated. I don't know much about Hinduism except that there is the concept of reincarnation that can give you better or worse reincarnated lives based on your dharma or path that you choose. I think it has a hell but the only people who are stuck there forever are the extremely evil people. Some may go there temporarily some people may be able to escape the reincarnation cycle, but it is probably a long process that seems almost impossible to achieve. From the Orthodox Christian perspective, it seems like all these outside ideas appeal to at least three conditions of the afterlife as a result of human rationality of the world around them. If we can classify people into three categories, like the few extremely righteous, the few extremely evil, and the majority of the average or mediocre people who seem like nice people, who don't look like they deserve to be punished, it would be natural to assume that there is some kind of rational, tolerable afterlife for them. That is, if you view the world from man's perspective. If you see sin through God's perspective, you will realize that all sin deserves God's wrath and that the only way anyone can go to heaven is by God's mercy and grace alone.
It was narrated that Jabir bin Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with them, said, We came with the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, entering Ihram for Hajj. Then the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, told us to make it Umrah and exit Ihram. He had the sacrificial animal with him, so he could not make it Umrah. Now, there are a lot of ahadith in both Sahih al-Bakari and Sahih Muslim that talk about sacrificial animals during Hajj. I have read all of Bukhari and Muslim and have seen nothing explaining why one should sacrifice animals. The assumption is that a sacrificial animal will atone for sins. Now, my Muslim friends, do you honestly think that if you had a wicked thought in your mind to murder someone you disliked or to commit adultery with a woman that you know, do you really think that Allah is perfectly happy with making an animal feel the pain of a knife instead of your feeling the pain of the hellfire for that sin, especially if he knows that you will do it again? Now, I don't know Sunni Islam enough to know if the sacrificial animal at Hajj is supposed to atone for sins or if it is just a religious ritual Allah wants them to perform. But either way seems like a problem in my mind. Why would Allah want you to kill an animal as just some kind of religious ritual if it has nothing to do with some kind of atonement? Of course, in the Orthodox Christian perspective, the animal sacrifice is pointed to Christ. God doesn't just command people to do religious things unless they represent something either to teach us something about Him or something about ourselves or both. Therefore, there are no such things as mindless meaningless religious rituals. The acceptance of the repentance of the one who kills even if he has killed a great deal. It was narrated from Abu Sa'id al-Qudri that the Prophet of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Among those who came before you, there was a man who killed 99 people. Then he asked who the most knowledgeable man on earth was, and he was directed to a monk. He went to him and told him that he had killed 99 people. Could he repent? The monk said no, so he killed him, thus completing 100. Then he asked who the most knowledgeable man on earth was, and he was directed to a man of knowledge, and said that he had killed 100 people. Could he repent? He said, yes. Who could stand between him and repentance? Go to such and such a land, for therein there are people who worship Allah. So go and worship Allah with them, and do not go back to your own land, for it is a bad land. So he set out then, when he was halfway there, death came upon him. The angels of mercy and the angels of torment disputed over him. The angels of mercy said, He came repenting and turning wholeheartedly toward Allah. The, angel, the angels of torment said, He never did anything good. Then an angel in the form of a man came to them and they appointed him to decide between them. He said, Measure the distance between the two lands, and whichever is closer, that is where he belongs. So they measured it, and they found that he was closer to the land he was heading for. So the angels of mercy took him. Atada said, Al-Hassan said, We were told that when death came to him, he leaned toward, toward the land he was heading for. There are multiple versions of this story in Sahih al-Bakari and Sahih Muslim, but they basically have this premise. A man has murdered 99 people. He asks a monk if Allah will accept his repentance. The monk says no. The man kills the monk, making his body count an even 100 people. He then goes to a scholar and asks the same, will Allah accept my repentance? The scholar suggests that the man go to a certain city where the people fear Allah and will instruct him on what to do. 
the man dies on his journey to that city. An angel from paradise and an angel from the fire argue over the man's soul. Allah, or another angel, comes to make the fateful decision. He decides that if the man was closer to the city he was going to than the city he was coming from, that he will go to paradise. Some versions say that they measured and found that he was closer to the city he was going to. Others say that Allah shrunk the earth until the man was one cubit closer to the city he was going to. Either way, the man goes to paradise because he was closer to that godly city. Some Muslim apologists will use this hadith to show Allah's mercy on someone who was a mass murderer simply because he wanted Allah's forgiveness, but didn't know how to get it. Orthodox Christianity does have some similarities in that a wicked person can be saved simply by putting his faith in Jesus alone for his salvation. The problem is that the Sunni Islamic theology is missing something in this story, justice. Because Orthodox Christianity demands that all sins must be punished, because God's law cannot be overthrown, then someone has to pay for the sins. In Sunni Islam, no one paid the sin debt to Allah for what the mass murderer did. Imagine how the friends of those hundred people felt when their friends or family were murdered by this guy. Now, if someone murdered one of your friends or family in cold blood, you would have a grudge against him. If he showed true repentance to you and showed that his life changed, you may or may not feel completely compassionate to him about it because it doesn't get you your friend or family member back. You may feel sorry for him because he has to answer to God and you wouldn't want to be in his shoes. What if someone believed that he can murder one person that he hates, then repent before Allah and say that he will never do it again? If God says that all murder must be punished, would you then like the idea that God will waive the punishment for that murder on a whim when a lot of other murderers don't get that mercy? Now, I do realize that any analogy is imperfect and can have a lot of arguments either way. The point is that this story isn't guaranteed for everyone. If it was, there would possibly be a lot more murderers thinking they can get away with it and God's justice for murder would seem pointless. If he keeps waving away the punishment, he said he would do. Why would God say that a lot of sins must be punished, then just wave the punishment away? Which is more perfect, God's law or God's mercy? Would the one burning in hell forever have a right to complain to God because he only murdered one person? Well, the man in the Hadith murdered a hundred people and got to go to paradise, all because God felt like being nice to him to teach us a lesson about his forgiveness. Then condemning the other murderer to teach us that not everyone gets his arbitrary forgiveness. vastness of Allah's mercy toward the believers, and every Muslim will be ransomed by a disbeliever from the fire. It was narrated that Abu Musa said, the messenger of Allah peace be upon him said, when the day of resurrection comes, Allah, glorified and exalted as he, will give every Muslim a Jew or a Christian, and he will say, this is your ransom from the fire. An and Sa'id bin Abi Burda narrated that they witnessed Abu Burda narrating to Umar bin Abdul Aziz from his father that the Prophet peace be upon him said, No Muslim man dies, but Allah causes a Jew or a Christian to enter the fire in his stead. Umar bin Abdul Aziz asked him to swear by Allah, 
besides whom none has the right to be worshipped, three times. That his father narrated that to him from the prophet, peace be upon him, and he swore to him. Sa'id did not tell me that he asked him to swear, but he did not object to what An said. Katada narrated a hadith like that of Afan, number 7012, with this chain of narrators, and he said An bin Uqba. It was narrated from Abu Burda, from his father, that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, On the day of resurrection, some Muslim people will come with sins like mountains. But Allah will forgive them and will place them, the sins, on the Jews and the Christians, as far as I reckon. Abu Ra said, I do not know who is the one who was uncertain. Abu Burda said, I narrated that to Umar bin Abdul Aziz. And he said, Did your father narrate that to you from the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him? I said, Yes. Now, for the Christians that may be watching this, before you start pointing fingers at the Sunni Muslims and saying, Ah, you see? They hate the Jews and the Christians. Let me just point out that the ahadith that I have just read here are the only ones like this that I have seen in all of Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim combined. These are only found in Sahih Muslim, and the text by itself wouldn't even fill up one page. In general, if a hadith is found in both Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, it would be considered Sahih, which means sound. I think this is a weak hadith. Think about it. If this were a strong hadith, politics would be different. No Muslim would have to worry about anything regarding their eternal destination. They would also want there to be enough Jews and Christians to exist to atone for their sins. After all, it kind of sounds like a balancing act. The more Jews and Christians that exist, the more confidence a Muslim could have that there is one that could be there to take his place in the fire. This one kind of makes me laugh because it says that some Muslim people will come with sins like mountains. I hear Muslim apologists mock Orthodox Christianity that it claims that people can live like the devil and still go to heaven. Just the fact that this hadith actually claims that someone can be legitimately called a Muslim but will have sins like mountains, that almost seems like an insult to the Muslims because it makes you wonder how many of them actually have sins like mountains. Also, the idea that the one listening to the hadith is shocked and asked the narrator to swear by Allah that he heard the Messenger of Allah say that kind of and sounds like it is a concept that is not common in the faith that would contradict a lot of the other hadith. Why am I bringing this uncommon one up if I believe that this is a weak hadith? I'm doing it to show my point that when one denies Jesus as the perfect mediator and substitute for sins, one can rationalize all kinds of other forms of mediation and redemption. One could seek mediation from the intercession of Muhammad, their own good deeds, the killing of animals, the arbitrary mercy of Allah, or even substituting a Jew or a Christian in their place. But it just can't be Jesus. It just can't be Jesus. It just can't. My Muslim friends, think about it. You believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah. He was born of a virgin. He was sinless. He performed many amazing miracles. He ascended into heaven, and he is coming back in the latter day to judge the world. If Jesus is all of this to you, can't he be more than just a prophet of Allah like the many others? What did he accomplish? Where is his Injil if what we have from this amazing prophet of Allah has been corrupted more than any other book in history? Why turn to all this other stuff for mediation and redemption of your sins when you know that the scriptures that came before you 
points to him as your mediator and redeemer. Think long and hard about this, my Muslim friends, before you trust in a religious system to fill in the gap between you and God. I hope you enjoyed this episode of A Gift from a Muslim, and stay tuned for a more casual and fun final episode.